Good morning. This morning's scripture reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 34, verses 1 through 24. The story Grant is preaching on is longer, consisting of all 31 verses in chapter 34. However, he figured he might lose you with such a lengthy reading, and verse 24 seemed like a reasonable stopping point. It is a substantial reading nonetheless, but a good story takes a little time to tell. Grant will cover the last part of the chapter during his sermon. So if you aren't familiar with the story, please don't read ahead. He chose the stopping point intentionally. So in a spirit of openness, let us now hear this ancient story anew. The author writes, Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to visit the women of the region. When Shechem son of Hamer the Hivite, (laughs) prince of the region, saw her, he seized her and lay with her by force. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, daughter of Jacob. He loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamer, saying, Get me this girl to be my wife. Now Jacob heard that Shechem had defiled his daughter Dinah, but his sons were with his cattle in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamer, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him, just as the sons of Jacob came in from the field. When they heard of it, the men were indignant and very angry, because he had committed an outrage in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, for such a thing ought not to be done. But Hamer spoke with them, saying, The heart of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him in marriage. Make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us. And take our daughters for yourselves. You shall live with us, and the land shall be open to you. Live and trade in it, and get property in it. Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, Let me find favor with you, and whatever you say to me, I will give. Put the marriage present and gift as high as you like, and I will give whatever you ask me. Only give me the girl to be my wife. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamer deceitfully, because he had defiled their sister Dinah. They said to him, We cannot do this thing, to give our sister to the one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we consent to you, that you will become as we are, and every male among you will be circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters for ourselves, and we will live among you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and be gone. Their words pleased Tamer, and Hamer's son Shechem. And the young man did not delay to do the thing because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. Now he was the most honored of all his family. So Hamer and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city, saying, These people are friendly with us. Let them live in the land and trade in it, for the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters in marriage, and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will they agree to live among us, to become one people, that every male among us be circumcised as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock, their property, and all their animals be ours? Only let us agree with them, and they will live among us. And all who went out of the city gate heeded Hammer and his son Shechem 
And every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of the city. Here ends the reading from the book of Genesis. Thanks be to God for these words of life. How many of you are familiar with this story? Raise your hand. That's kind of what I thought, like two or three. I wouldn't exactly put it in the Bible's greatest hits album. So I'm going to run through it again, just so we're all on the same page. The, so this story is about a woman named Dinah or Dina. There's multiple ways you can pronounce a lot of these names. I'm going to go with Dina. If you take a look at the back page of your bulletin, it's small type, I know, and I'm sorry about that, but you'll see a sort of biblical family tree for the book of Genesis as well as some later books. And at the very bottom, you'll see Jesus Christ in all caps. Clearly, a Christian individual put this together. Um, but if you look at the pink box that is directly located above Jesus, that is Dina. And I don't want to spend a ton of time sort of situating her in the biblical narrative, but if you are a visual person and you're interested in that sort of thing, I hope that that resource is helpful. So this story begins with Dina going out uh, to visit with some of the women uh, in the region, and a prince from a different tribe, Shechem, lays with her by force, which is another way of saying that he rapes her. And then the story says, his soul was drawn to Dina, daughter of Jacob. He loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. He spoke tenderly to her. I'm not sure if he's realized he's done a bad thing and is trying to like fix it, but in the worst way possible, or if this is just an insane sense of entitlement. I'm leaning towards entitlement though, because like so many spoiled little boys, he runs to his daddy and says, I want this thing, and I want it now. So, of course, daddy tries to patch things up. In today's world, patching something like this up isn't as easy as offering to buy your rape victim from her father and make her your wife. But before we get too high and mighty about how far we've come in 3,000 years, Today, this looks more like what Stanford swim, the Stanford swimmer who raped Chanel Miller Brock Turner did. Get some good legal counsel. If Hamor, Shechem's father, could get Shechem only six months with three years of probation like Brock, maybe even less since Dina was conscious, I can see him taking that deal, which is deeply and profoundly disturbing. But unpacking that is another sermon altogether. So let's get back to the story. Shechem's father, Hamor, tries to make this into an enticing political and economic opportunity while sweetening the deal with a name your price dowry option. Jacob at this point is an old man and so the decision-making power is sort of transitioning between him and his 12 sons. His sons, deceitfully, demand that not only Shechem, but all the Hivites be circumcised, and then they will happily intermarry. Shechem goes back to his boys and, interestingly, also makes a similar economic argument to them. Will not their, their being Jacob's livestock, their property, and all their animals be ours? And the Hivites did it. The story doesn't say how much livestock and property Jacob has, but holy smokes, for them to be like, what's the procedure? Oh yeah, sure, yeah, let's do that right now. Yep, let's do it. That must have been quite a bit of capital. Or Shechem is like the best motivational speaker in the history of humankind. But either way, all the men undergo this super painful procedure, which could arguably be seen as sort of a poetic and yet still ret uh, retributive justice, if you think about it. But nonetheless, we pick back up here, right after what I have to imagine is a pretty bizarre scene at the city gate. And then the end of the story is verses 25 through 31. Our author writes, on the third day when they were still in pain, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brothers took their swords and came against the city unawares and killed 
all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. And the other sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys and whatever was in the city and in the field. All their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, all that was in the houses they captured and made their prey. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me odious to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, should our sister be treated like a whore? And that's the end of the story. My wife, Anna, like many of you, had not heard this story before I decided to preach on it. And so when I read it aloud to her after the words, and came against the city unawares and killed all the males, she couldn't help herself and responded, oh, snap. Or at least when I'm telling the story in the pulpit, that's what she said. And rightfully so. I mean, when I, when I asked for more of her thoughts after the story ended, she said something to the effect of, I mean, killing Shechem, I get that, and maybe even his dad, but like all the guys, that seems like a little bit much. And her response brings us to the Our Whole Lives topic this morning, which is toxic masculinity. When we sat down to figure out who was going to preach on what, the rest of the staff thought I would be great for this topic. <laughs> I don't know why. It could be because of my haircut, the name of which I can't say in the pulpit, or the snapback flat brim hats I wear all the time, my love of sports, aversion to shirt sleeves, the fact that I call the Sundays I preach game day and listen to pump up music while I put on my uniform. I guess now that I think about it, I might embody some of the bro stereotypes in my appearance. But masculinity is wrapped up in much more than clothing and word choice. There is a masculine need to control, to protect, to assert dominance. And we see that in this Bible story. Simeon and Levi are angry, and for good reason. Their sister was raped. But even their father says that this was an overreaction. We, we meaning young men, have been known to do this, to overreact with violence when we are angry. I want to show you the trailer for a documentary that came out in 2015 for a movie titled The Mask You Live In. I think it does a great job explaining for those of you who might not be familiar with this concept, what the idea of masculinity is and how it plays out in our culture. The video said that boys buy into this idea of a culture that doesn't value what we've feminized. The trailer doesn't go into it, but the documentary itself takes that idea to its next logical step, which is that a culture that doesn't value the feminine doesn't value women. Our culture encourages men to treat women not as human beings, but as objects. Which brings us back to Dina. As far as female characters in the Bible, the fact that she gets a name at all is significant. Other women in the Bible are raped and murdered without the dignity of a name. And yet, not a single line of the story is devoted to what she says or how she feels. She is raped and then used as a means to an end. The story says, they killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dina out of Shechem's house. They took her out of his house? How did that conversation go down? All right, Dina, we know that Shechem literally just raped you and we totally plan to kill him and all of his friends and family, but we're going to need you to go live in his house with him. Yeah, live in your attacker's house and pretend to be in love with him for several days. And then assuming they don't realize we're coming to save you and kill you, we'll rescue you during our raid on the city. We can guess that she definitely did not want to do that. 
And you wonder whether she even wanted her brothers to kill everyone in the city. Well, you might wonder, but I, unfortunately, have a pretty good guess. See, when I was in my early 20s, a young woman I'm very close with was raped. My relationship to her was similar to that of Simeon or Levi. She was someone I felt obligated to protect, someone whom I loved and still love very deeply. And like that situation with Dina, I too knew the young man who raped her. About 80% of rapes are committed by someone known to the victim. And in this case, he was known to me as well. We weren't friends, but I had met him in person. I had shaken his hand. And that young woman with whom I was so close didn't tell me for a year. Now that is absolutely her right to do, but I nonetheless asked, why? Why didn't you let me help? And she asked me what I would have done if she had told me the day after it happened. And I told her the truth. I told her that I had a pretty good idea of where I could find him, and that I would have driven over there with a baseball bat and brought him to within inches of his life. Now, that's not killing him, his father, all his family and friends, but if the legal system in this country was like that of ancient Israel, that option may have been on the table in my mind. Respect is linked to violence indeed. And do you know what her response was? How can you be there for me in the future if you're in prison? I knew you would get angry and maybe go after him, and I didn't want to deal with this and you being charged with assault. That's why she didn't tell me for a year. Because of my masculinity. Because of my toughness. Because of my pride and my aggression and my need to protect and all those things that I thought were good male qualities. Because of all that, I couldn't be there for her in her time of greatest need. Inflicting pain, dominating, taking control from him the way he did from her wasn't about protecting her. It was about me. It was about responding the way I wanted to respond. And she knew me well enough to know that I wouldn't be helpful to her. Because of my own toxic masculinity, I forced a young woman I love very much to manage both her own assault and my fragile male ego at the same time. What kind of man does that? She and perhaps Dina didn't want or need more violence. She wanted healing. She wanted an ear to listen, a shoulder to cry on, a friend who was strong enough not to continue the cycle of violence, but to accompany her, accompany her through the valley of grief and anger and hurt. That's where real strength lies. In having enough emotional maturity so I don't force the women in my life to bear the burden of thinking about how and when to present their pain to me in such a way that I don't go and do something stupid. I don't know if I've ever been more disappointed in myself than I was at that moment. I let a friend down in the most profound way. And it was completely and totally my fault. In my narrow, ignorant, childish understanding of what it means to protect someone I care about, my own selfishness and arrogance were on full display. And I can't change that. I can't change what happened to her, and I can't change how I responded back then. But I do know that I never want to feel that way again, and more importantly, I never want someone I love to feel that way again. 
I've changed quite dramatically since that conversation years ago. When I look at myself back then, I know I wasn't ready to be a minister yet. To think that violence would resolve that situation. My beloved wife, Anna, told me not to include that bit about the baseball bat. How jarring it would be for all of you to hear about your pastor even considering something so violent. But we are a people who believe in resurrection and that God has the power to transform even our worst impulses into something new. It took a lot to move me out of that place. Years of therapy, meditation practices, workshops on nonviolent communication, intentionality and listening to both the men and women in my life, reading books and articles that challenged my understanding of the world as a white, wealthy American man, but perhaps ironically, this wasn't really about learning something new. True empathy, caring for others, attentive listening, these are not feminine traits. These are basic human traits. I had to go back and give myself permission to process grief. I had to go back and give myself permission to cry because the emotions have to go somewhere. If I don't know what to do or where to go with my pain, then I found I tended to do one of two things with it. I transmitted it onto other people, both knowingly and unknowingly, or I drowned the pain in a glass of whiskey. I hadn't learned how to develop and process all of my emotions. And that process of undoing the destructive effects of be a man culture is ongoing for me, and I would argue for all of us. How can we shape the future of masculinity? Well, instead of, of going with our aggressive gut reactions, let's start with empathy. We never get to hear what Dina needs because her brothers are too busy ransacking a city. And I never heard what my sister in Christ needed because she knew I'd go the same route as Simeon and Levi. But maybe if we take a look at our own reactions with a critical eye, we can begin to see how our assumptions might be doing us a disservice. We can build the confidence to be part of the solution, even if that means saying things that might make other men feel uncomfortable. Every boy measures his masculinity at the deepest level against his dad. And we can affirm that anything, anything a father does with his son is masculine. Cooking, fishing, puzzles, sports, reading, it doesn't matter, whatever it is. There is such freedom beyond the bounds of these rigid definitions of manhood. And what a gift that could be we could give to the next generation. All of us, you don't have to be a father. We all have a role to play in creating a healthier culture. We, you and me, beginning right now, can help build a new world. Some might call it the kingdom of God here on earth where young men can show their courage in compassion, their valor in vulnerability, and their love in liberation. Amen.